In the 1920s, a wind of folly swept over European photography. The buildings photographed by Czech photographer Funke tilted dangerously. There were no more horizontals or verticals to latch onto, as in this photograph taken at the Bauhaus by Moholinaji. There was no longer anything to clearly indicate whether this photo of a couple photographed by German photographer Umbo should be viewed like this or this. This divorce from photographic propriety that jolted the horizons of the past out of the alignment was referred to as the new vision. It was a new way of seeing and living, shared by Lux Feininger and his students, playing the banjo on the roof of the Bauhaus, as well as the new socialist man, photographed by Russian photographer Rodchenko. This new vision was one of an industrial and urban world, a world of speed and machines, of the straight lines of railway tracks and city streets. And with the task of producing images of this world, here comes the new photographer. This was the title of a book published in 1929, in which German photographer Werner Graf revealed the secrets of new photography to the public. Here, he explains, is an old-style photograph, framed according to the Renaissance artist's rules of perspective. Everything in this image is straight, corresponding to what people saw if they looked straight ahead of them, as this photomontage by the author shows. But this viewpoint, continues Werner Graf, does not correspond to today's vision, because the real modern man, the city pedestrian, never looks straight in front of him, as this second photomontage shows, but moves his eyes constantly up or down, always moving, always diagonally. This led to the conclusion that the diagonal was the axis of modernity and its vertiginous perspectives par excellence. The following page explains why urban dwellers look upwards, because of the huge buildings that surround them. It followed quite naturally, therefore, that the favorite position for the new photographer's lens should be with the lens pointing upwards, the low angle shot. With the low angle shot, one could glorify the immensity of modern constructions. The vast vertical lines of the skyscrapers, photographed by Danish photographer Nud Lonberg Holm, or of the factory chimneys of German photographer Albert Renger Patsch. These were favorite subjects of the new photographers, who only very rarely photographed nature, which was too unruly for them. With one notable exception, these pine trees photographed by Russian photographer Rodchenko. It was a one-off, however, and he was careful to add that in photographing the trees, he primarily saw the telegraph poles they were to become. Nineteen twenty-nine. The man with a movie camera also pointed his lens upwards in the film by Russian filmmaker Ziga Vertov, who was a friend of Rodchenko. But immediately after that, he started tracking down heights. The camera in a dominant position with the lens pointing downwards is a high angle shot. Along with the low angle shot, the high angle shot was the other favorite vantage point of the new photographer. Paris, Place de l'Etoile in 1926, taken by the German photographer Germaine Kroll, a spectacular image playing on a vertiginous perspective. But above all, it gives the impression we can master the oversized city, reduced here to the size of a child's toy by the photographer's vantage point. Seen from above and from afar, everything appears simpler, 
Individual differences are erased by the global view, the collective order. Even the boats in the port of Marseille take on a disciplined, orderly appearance in this image by Moholinaji. The complexity of reality disappears behind abstraction. The city at night, photographed by German photographer Umbo, so imposing when seen from below, becomes nothing more than an interplay of form and light. With the high angle shot, Russian photographer Rodchenko, who came to photography through painting, rediscovered the charms of the foreshortened perspective of the Renaissance painters by grouping in the same plane objects separated by depth, that of the building and that of the street, in this assembling for a demonstration. For him, it was not a pictorial reference, but on the contrary, evidence of the absolute newness of the photographic perspective. This was the only perspective that could capture on the same plane both the head and the feet of this woman on the telephone. Placed at the same vantage point, the human eye would not see the image in this strange way, as the eye instinctively creates an impression of depth. These unexpected vantage points had a manifesto value for Rochenko. Fire Escape with a Man, 1925. All painting, he wrote, is painted at navel height, or else at eye height. We must remove this veil of navel gazing from our eyes and photograph from top to bottom, from bottom to top, from any point of view but that of the navel. Pioneer with a Horn, 1930. One can go even further and higher to the extreme vantage point of the perfect vertical, inspired by aerial photography, which developed during the First World War. Seen in this way, the most ordinary image takes on an enigmatic appearance. Only the presence, probably involuntary, of the tip of the photographer Lux Renninger's shoe helps us realize that we are simply looking at the top of a flight of steps. The vertical high angle shot inverses all reference points. In this image by German photographer Umbo, belonging to a series entitled The Uncanny Street, the passers-by are reduced to dots. Yet their shadows appear to be animated by a life of their own, inhabiting their own world. The world of the pavement towering before our eyes like a wall or an abstract painting. Scientific photography opens up further amusing perspectives that are unknown to the human eye. A game of cards unlike any we have ever seen. To create this 180 degree view, Umbo used the fisheye lens of a weather station, which he then pointed at more familiar subjects, such as this image of Potsdamer Platz. It was a technical feat, a way of enlarging the field of our perception through the optical properties of the lens in a way that was almost independent of the vantage point of the photographer whose small figure appears at the very bottom of the shot. Science and technology. The new vision celebrated the age of the machine, of robots and mechanics, and of modernity in action, filmed by Ruttmann in Berlin. Symphony of a Metropolis. The machine was not merely photogenic, it was a model to be imitated. Umbo worked on the film too and created this famous photomontage as a poster for the film. Modern man armed with all his artificial replacements, with a camera instead of an eye, that was new, too. Ever since it had been invented, the camera had been required to equal the human eye. Now the human eye was being required to learn from the camera. But joking aside, the theoretical basis of the new vision was as rigorous as the squared paper of this double-exposure self-portrait of Russian constructivist El Lisitsky.
the artist as engineer, the compass in his eye. For the constructivists, artistic activity was inseparable from revolutionary activity. In 1925, Elisitsky illustrated and published poems by Mayakovsky calling readers to the revolution, entitled For the Voice, in other words, slogan poems. It was a summary of constructivist aesthetics. Pictograms carried out mechanically, flat tints with no nuances, with the desire to be violently expressive, escaping traditional realist representations. And above all, use of the straight line, the functional line par excellence, the diagonals of which contradict the format of the page so as to translate the revolutionary energy of the content. So in order to apply the constructivist principles to photography, you just had to seek out straight lines in a diagonal in the vast world. That is what Rodchenko did with one of his most famous photographs, Stairs, 1930. Opposing the diagonal of a flight of steps is the diagonal of a woman carrying her child. The camera tilt creates tension and gives the simple passerby the confident allure of a heroine from battleship Potemkin. But being the master photographer he was, Rodchenko could apply the same principle to a subject that had nothing heroic about her. A young girl daydreaming on a bench. The diagonals forced by the slant of the camera throw the image out of balance. The young woman looking outwards appears to be held in the image by the frames of shadows of a trellis wall. The photograph is called Girl with a Leica in reference to the almost invisible camera she is holding. The Leica, which appeared in 1925, was small, solid, and quick to operate. Rodchenko made it his camera of choice, as it was ideal for the gymnastics that the new vantage points demanded. With the Leica, he could create unsettling, perfectly constructed images, despite their improvised appearance. Driver, a reflection in the chrome headlamp of a car. The poor man's fisheye lens, transformed into a veritable spatial conundrum by the simple presence of a pipe in the foreground, probably the chauffeur's. With these photographs, which appeared in the magazine Novi Lef, The New Left, Rodchenko wanted to teach socialist man a new language, the language of the visual revolution, which for Rodchenko went hand in hand with the revolution, full stop. It was an entertaining, gently provocative way of teaching. Some magazine covers were designed as riddles. The reader, wanting to understand what this image depicted, for example, first had to rotate it through 90 degrees. Balconies photographed using a low-angle shot by Rodchenko. Balconies photographed using a high-angle shot by Moholy Naji. The similarity is evidence of the exchanges and convergences between Russians and Germans. The balconies, which Moholy Naji photographed on several occasions, are part of the students' residence at the Bauhaus complex in Dessau, also photographed by Moholy Naji's wife, Lucy. The Bauhaus was the center of the German avant-garde, it was a school of applied art in which architecture and design reigned supreme. Alongside Gropius, Kandinsky, and Bayer, Moholinaji played a major role there. Like Rodchenko, Moholinaji arrived at photography via painting, which figured in prime position in a work published at the Bauhaus in 1925, Painting, Photography, Film. It was a summary of its theoretical principles, the learnings of which were close to those of the Russian constructivists. With one difference, the representation was totally apolitical. One no longer said revolutionary dynamics, but dynamic of the metropolis. It was the title of a screenplay that never made it to a film, but was carefully laid out and published in the book. The word repeated most often was tempo, rhythm, the tension of the straight lines, the lines of functionalism and modernity of the layout of streets and the paths of machines. 
Moholinaji's dynamic applied to photography. It was essentially an exercise on composition, seeking to create a tension between the rectangle of the frame of the image and the diagonals that structured it, tracks, shadows, and the movement of people. The deserted avenue and the depthless pavement create a neutral background on which the lines stand out even more starkly. This dynamic was also a search for imbalance. In a classical approach, the photographer, Hausmann, would have waited until the tram, his subject matter, had arrived in the center of the image. Instead, he deliberately placed it off-center. The tram, photographed just as it entered the frame, leaves a wide open space in front of it, into which the future movement is projected. The empty space becomes part of the composition. In this photograph, in the Uncanny Street series by Umbo, who had also studied at the Bauhaus, the empty space occupies half the image, whereas in this other photograph, it takes up residence in the center, pushing back into the corners of the frame the humans and their shadows the passers-by and the road sweeper, each in their own world, separated by the street and the diagonal of the pavement. Bold cropping was another way of sweeping aside former reference points. A nude by Raoul Hausmann, 1927. The body is clipped by the edges of the frame, as though it had too much energy for a simple rectangle. The clipped effect renders the pose unrealistic and highlights the almost abstract interplay of forms in which the arm and the thigh trace a new variant on the constructivist diagonal. The absence of reference points ends up destroying the very notion of the subject. In this photograph by Umbo entitled Tanja and Willy, all we see of Willy is this one eye which seems to have forced its way into the frame but there's nothing to help us understand the real meaning of this disconcerting connection of the open eye and the closed eye, which each viewer remains free to interpret as they wish. The image no longer seeks to say something. It no longer literally means anything. The fragmentation shatters the coherence of the individual and of the world. The only reality that remains is that of the page and the photographer's eye, capable of sticking the pieces back together. Raoul Hausmann, Photomontage, 1925. Hans Richter, Rhythmus, 1925. Pure and simple abstraction was a temptation for some of these photographers. An easy way to avoid the contradiction between constructivist rigor and the random nature of reality was simply getting rid of reality and placing in front of the camera several square forms cut from a stiff material, lit in such a way as to create a structure of forms and light. Czech photographer Jaromar Funke did just this in his abstract compositions of 1924. Another abstraction from another Czech photographer, Jaroslav Rosler. But here he did not use cut out paper. The triangle of light is that of a square fan light in the corridor of a building, cut diagonally by the wall of the foreground, which the photographer took care to frame on the right edge of the image. In the same way, this splendid spiral photographed by Germain Kroll is nothing more than a simple spiral staircase, metamorphosized by the interplay of contrasts. Moholinaji experimented with this power of light from the early 1920s with his photograms, which, like Man Ray's rayograms, were negative prints of objects placed directly onto the sensitive surface of photographic paper. It was photography in its bare state, Pure, radiant writing, said Moholinaji, freed from any descriptive function. Raoul Hausmann provided his own version of the phenomenon by photographing the sunlight that passed through the open work seat of a chair. But on closer inspection, we observe an incongruous rectangle under the chair. There's a trick. 
the actual pattern projected onto the floor is much duller. Hausman enhanced it by slipping a stiff sheet of reflective material under the chair. Another effect of openwork weaving, even more ordinary this time, Window, 1928, by Florence Henry, a former Bauhaus pupil. The minimalist interplay of form and light and the sobriety of form are like a means of protection from the spectacle of the large modern city, from its chaos and confusion. The cinema, with its effects of movement and editing, managed quite naturally to reproduce this assault of random images and impressions, this accelerated and accidental point of view. For photography, it was, of course, more difficult, but the new vision, fascinated as much by the city as by cinema, managed to do so. In 1931, Lithuanian photographer Moy Ver, who had also studied at the Bauhaus, created in his book entitled Paris a veritable photographic kaleidoscope, which managed to give the illusion of an image in perpetual movement. The techniques he used, the superimposition of several negatives or multiple exposures, blended with the wild images the city produced itself, the reflections of the shop windows and the asphalt, the overlapping of silhouettes and lines. Photomontage was another way to rival cinema. 1923, Metropolis is a collage of nearly 200 fragments of recovered postcards and images created by Dutch artist Paul Citroën for an exhibition at the Bauhaus. It was what Moholy Nagy called an experimental method of simultaneous representation. The panic-stricken eye of the pedestrian gave way to the distant view of the esthete, who transformed the chaos of the modern city into a carefully composed tapestry. At the time, the work was very influential, but it was a daydream. This is what the ingenious Umbo seems to say. He had the idea of superimposing the negative of Metropolis onto that of a profile of his friend Paul Citroën. Combining photomontage and superimposition, he created this astounding portrait of the visionary artist capable of having the entire future city in his head. Because new vision contains the word vision, an imaginary projection of a radiant future. This belief in modernity and progress characterized the experimental photography of the 1920s just as much as its search for form. We can see it equally in the communist El Lisitsky's perspective in this self-portrait of 1924 as in the portrait of this young woman full of dynamism and self-confidence photographed by Moholy Nagy in 1927. We can see it, too, in this optimistic portrait of Lily Brick, photographed by Rodchenko for an advert promoting Soviet literature. But this optimism did not resist the economic and political crises of the late 1920s. The era of the new vision was over. In Germany, talk was now of the new objectivity, a frontal neutrality embodied by photographers such as Auguste Sander. Form was no longer at the service of visual experimentation. Instead, it was at the service of the reality of the subject in all its substance. At the same time in the Soviet Union, Rodchenko's new vantage points were publicly condemned as plagiarism of German photography a bourgeois aestheticization of reality with no social utility. He continued, however, to take photographs, but what would the Rochenko of the 1920s have said about this photograph of a seal which he took in the 1940s? Perhaps the country of socialism, he wrote at the time, needs neither magic carpets, fireworks, nor kaleidoscopes. Nor avant-garde, one might add, but Rodchenko did not write that. 
the word had now been forbidden.